All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series where we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and practice exams. As always, when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Elise wants to use a changing criterion design to help her sister decrease the amount of money she spends each week. Elise sets an initial criterion, creates a reinforcement system, and then begins the intervention with her sister. What should Elise check for throughout treatment to better understand if a functional relationship exists? All right, so we're looking at Elise, and what is Elise doing? She wants to use a changing criterion design to decrease her sister's behavior. The question is specifically asking about what Elise needs to check for throughout treatment to understand if a functional relationship exists. Now, when does a functional relationship exist? It exists when R independent variable or R manipulation is impacting the dependent variable and nothing else. And so ideally, you always want a functional relationship because it means you are controlling the behavior. And so for each experimental design, there's different ways to check for functional relationships. In this particular scenario, we're looking at a change in criterion design. In a change in criterion design, we set a criterion, and then depending on which way you want the behavior to move, we either increase or decrease it. In Elise's case, since she wants to decrease it, then let's say she sets the criterion at $100 a week. She'll move it down to, let's say, 90, then 80, so on and so forth. So this is Elisa's strategy. How is she going to understand if a functional relationship exists? A, she should verify that her sister's behavior change is coinciding with the criterion changes. Is it true that you want the behavior to follow the criterion changes? Absolutely, that's the entire idea. The behavior should move as the criterion moves. So A is absolutely true. Now, do we pick A and move on? No, we read every single answer choice every time. B, she should verify that her sister's behavior does not revert to prior levels if the criterion has changed to a prior level. What is that saying? Well, that's saying is if we go from 100 to 90 and then back to 100, B is saying the behavior should follow the change. We know that's not true. The functional relationship says that behavior will follow the change regardless of what direction it moves. So B is false. C, she should verify that the data points are not all near the criterion line, but scattered further away. Is that true? Well, no, we want the data as close to possible to the criterion line, because that means the criterion is where the behavior is, and it's controlling the behavior. If my criterion's 80, I want the sister spending $80 or as close to $80 as possible during that criterion change. C is false. D should verify that the criterion changes are as small as possible each time criterion is changed. Again, is this true? Well, not necessarily. The, the, the larger jump you can make when you change the criterion, and if the behavior follows, the more sure you can have that you the more sure you are that a functional relationship exists. So if I go from 90 to 50, that's a big jump. But if behavior changes from 90 to 50, that's a pretty good indication we're controlling the behavior. This is not the easiest question in the world, but you can see how we broke it down. We went slow when we were able to analyze each answer choice very specifically. And by going slow, we've actually gone quicker than if you try to rush through a question like this. Never rush, okay? Slow is fast, right? Eventually, the slower you go when you're practicing, the faster you'll eventually become. So our answer here is going to be, she should verify that her sister's behavior change is coinciding with the criterion changes. If you're a behavior analyst were tasked with explaining to a client why contiguity in treatment is important, how might you explain this phenomenon? All right, so you need to explain contiguity. Now, what is contiguity? Contiguity says the closeness of the consequence is important, meaning, when a response occurs, we want to try to deliver the consequence as soon as possible. You don't want response, 10 second delay, then consequence. You want response, consequence every single time. That's very, very important. 
especially with reinforcement and especially with well, all consequences, right? Let's just leave it at that. All consequences should be close to the response. So how would you explain that? A, we want to continuously measure the behavior when we first start tracking it to get a good idea of how often it occurs throughout the day. A may be true, but it has nothing to do with contiguity, so A is out. B, even if someone doesn't know or aren't aware that they are being reinforced, the reinforcement may still be effective. What is B describing? Well, B is describing automaticity, the idea that even if someone doesn't know there's a consequence or that reinforcement is occurring, it can still be effective. We're not talking automaticity, we're talking contiguity. So C, ideally you want to provide praise or other reinforcement as soon as possible following the correct response. Yes, out of all these options, this is going to be the best way to describe contiguity. Now, you might want to remove some of the jargon maybe, but it's still simple enough to understand that when the correct response occurs, we need to provide that consequence as soon as possible. That is the key to contiguity. So this is almost a term question disguised as an explanation question. Fluency here is obviously the key because if you know what contiguity is, it's a very simple question. If you don't, you might struggle. Fluency, 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 that has to come first. You tell each of your three children that they can all have one cookie if, in 10 minutes, you check on them and they are not fighting with one another. They have the chance to earn three cookies as you will check in on them three times after exactly 10 minutes each time. What does this most resemble? Think about this. What does this most resemble? You are saying to your children, they can have a cookie if you check on them and they are not fighting with one another. So you're going to reinforce in the absence of a behavior. What differential reinforcement procedure reinforces when a behavior is not occurring? The DRO. DRO, we pick a target behavior. If it's not occurring, we reinforce. Now, it doesn't help us much because A, B, C, and D are all DROs. So let's continue. What does the schedule look like? Well, you are going to check in on them three times after exactly 10 minutes each time, meaning when 10 minutes is up, you're going to check. What measurement do we use when we are checking in on somebody at the end of each interval? Well, momentary time sampling, right? And so if we look at A and B, we have momentary DROs. That's what we're looking for. Now, is this a fixed or a variable momentary time sampling? Well, it's going to be fixed because each time you're checking after exactly 10 minutes. Variable implies an average. This is not an average. This is a, an exact number every single time. So after exactly 10 minutes each time, what are you doing? Well, you're checking in on them. So you are using a fixed momentary DRO. Don't be intimidated by what appears to be a difficult answer choice. Break it down, just like we would anything else. Fixed is unchanging. It's not an average. That's what we have, exactly 10 minutes. Momentary is at the end of each interval. Exactly 10 minutes occurs, so at the end of each interval. And then we're using a DRO. Put them all together, very straightforward. Your son has a small plastic chair that he likes to sit in while he plays at the table. One day, he tried to pick up the chair and move it, but the chair got stuck on something in his playpen. He started to cry, so you said, do you need help? And waited for an answer. What are you likely attempting? All right, pretty straightforward question, I think. We have your son. He's got a chair that he likes to sit in. He picked it up to move it, but the chair got stuck. He started to cry. Instead of going over there and helping him immediately or comforting him, you said, because you're using naturalistic teaching, do you need help? And waited for an answer. What are you trying to get here? What are you trying to evoke? You want your son to communicate that they need help. Now, this is a great opportunity to do it. He's in a moment of distress. It's a naturally occurring situation. Do you need help? You want him to answer in the affirmative. So what are you likely attempting here? A, the pre-MAC principle. Well, the pre-MAC principle, or grandma's law, says, I will give you the opportunity to engage in a highly preferred response or activity as reinforcement for engaging in a low preferred response or activity. It's not really what you're doing here. You're not really setting up that contingency because you're not offering anything. You've just used this incident, incidental teaching, right, to set up a moment where you can teach your son how to ask for help. So same thing with B, a high P request sequence. You're not delivering these 
high probability request followed by that low probability request. It's not what is occurring here. What's occurring is you're teaching this functional communication training using naturalistic teaching. By engaging your son when he starts to cry and you know he needs help, you can ask, do you need help and wait? This is a great example of naturalistic teaching to teach functional communication training. When he gives an answer, then you can reinforce. So what are you likely attempting? C, functional communication training. Of the following, a multiple baseline is not typically recommended or used to evaluate what? Now, if you've been around my channel a while, you might have seen this question before. I think it's an important question because multiple baselines are really set up for three key ideas. All right, multiple baselines are typically set up for across settings, meaning I could do baselines in home, clinic, school, or participants. So John, Jacob, and Jill, or behaviors, so aggression, elopement, screaming. Typically, though, you don't really evaluate multiple interventions using multiple baseline. It's just not typically how this type of experimental design is set up. Typically, you're going to go across settings, across participants, or across behaviors, because what you're trying to figure out is what does that intervention look like? Uh, almost generalized, right? Because different settings, what does it look like in different settings? Or participants, different participants. What about different behaviors, right? Interventions, you really focus on that one intervention. Now, we say typically, because who knows, there might be situations. But in the most typical fashion, multiple baselines going to be used across settings, participants, and behaviors, and not interventions. So in a way, it's kind of a teaching question, straightforward question. But remember, we're practicing. We just want to get better. So if you knew that, that's great. If you didn't, then you just learned something. We answer, we move on. Which of the following measurement strategies is most likely to overestimate rate of behavior? Again, pretty straightforward question, but we don't want to take these straightforward questions for granted because these are the easy ones. So what measurement strategy is going to overestimate rate of behavior? So when we overestimate rate, what are we doing? Well, rate is frequency over time. So we're, we're if we're overestimating that, we're probably going to have too high of a frequency, maybe too low of a time. Now, which one of these strategies is going to give us a, a large frequency or a large count? Whole interval recording? Well, maybe not necessarily, because if my interval is 15 seconds and the behavior happens for 14 seconds, our data are going to indicate the behavior didn't happen at all. It's just not true. Whole interval tends to underestimate. Partial interval, however, tends to overestimate. Because that, if that behavior happens for a split second and a 20 second interval, data are going to show it happened the whole time. So, partial interval really overestimates rate of behavior. Momentary time sampling and play check, same idea because play check is the group version. You can't really predict if you're going to overestimate or underestimate with momentary because it's at the end of each interval, right? So, it could be either or. The one that is most likely, most likely to overestimate rate is going to be partial interval recording. Excellent. Thank you for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Please subscribe if you have not already. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.